now move on to the next speaker, who is Ed Kalea from the Fire Safety Center and the Center for Numerical Modeling and Process Analysis at the University of Greenwich, and is going to talk about FSEG, COVID-19 mitigation analysis using CFD and agent-based model. Um, Ed, if you're good to go, all yours. Thanks very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me along to this presentation. Um, I hope you can see my screen without all these other things in the way. But um, uh, just to uh, emphasize, this talk is a, is a result of work by the Fire Safety Engineering Group. I've listed all my colleagues on the first slide that have contributed to this work. Uh, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about agent-based models, but also about our CFD models, because I really don't think you can use agent-based models uh, on, on, a, on a fine scale, um, say a building scale, without taking into account um, impact of uh, the different vectors for infection. Uh, just a very brief uh, overview of the Fire Safety Engineering Group. We're a team of about 20 full-time researchers. We do, we've been working on for 30 years, developing agent-based models and computational fluid dynamics models. We have models for building size environments, uh, and transport environments, and urban scale environments. And we also do a lot of work in understanding the behavior of people, how people react and behave to quantify um, uh, what we have in our models. Um, the, if we're going to talk about um, uh, infection probabilities and, and, and mitigation strategies, we really need to think about the, 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 the three main ways in which um, uh, uh, COVID can spread. And uh, the first two are listed here, uh, the large droplet uh, concept, where you have large respiratory droplets greater than about 100 uh, 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 micrometers. Uh, these are like cannonballs and they follow uh, trajectories that fall to the ground in, in seconds and within about two meters. Uh, and the susceptible population uh, is infected either through inhalation of these large droplets or with the large droplets falling in, for example, the uh, impact of the eyes. And from this concept, we had the, uh, uh, the, the, re the recommendations of two meter physical distancing, avoiding uh, direct face-to-face, -face, uh, uh, contacts, face shields, partial shields, and one-way systems, none of which was validated in any way um, uh, as to the um, efficacy of these approaches. The second uh, uh, vector is the formite uh, infection. And this is uh, where the large droplets fall on surfaces. You touch the surfaces of your hands, uh, and then um, you touch your face and spread the infection to your face. And, and hence we had this, uh, 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 this um, Macbeth uh, period where everyone was washing their hands excessively. Uh, and, uh, and today the CDC has announced uh, something like this uh, form of infection is probably less than, you have a one in 10,000 chance of being infected uh, through this route. Now, um, based on these, we've developed agent-based models and this is an example of the Exodus agent-based model. Uh, and uh, the animation you see on the right are the agents trying to maintain a two meter physical distancing. We can build this into our agent-based models, change the behavior rules. So the agents attempt to keep physical distancing. Uh, and this is very, very useful for calculating things like the impact uh, physical distancing has on um, capacity, for example, level of service and, and throughput through, through a structure. Um, in this particular case, for example, there's less crowding at the exit, and, uh, but the, the time it takes for people to transit through this is increased by about almost 20%. Now, the difficulty of this is, is that it, it ignores probably the most important vector for uh, um, transmission of COVID, which is the airborne infection route. And, and this is due to small respiratory uh, droplets, less than about 100 uh, micrometers. Now these aerosols can be dispersed through the air as a result of the ventilation system, the thermal effects coming off people's bodies, and the wake effects caused by the movement of people. So the actual movement of the agents will affect the way the aerosols are dispersed and hence the probability of infection. Uh, because of uh, the aerosol route, uh, we have the recommended uh, mitigations of wearing face coverings and having high uh, ventilation rates. So in my opinion, this is why agent-based models um, on a building scale um, are not very useful for determining uh, infection probabilities or assessing the impact of mitigation strategies because they effectively ignore uh, this uh, uh, concept. 
you can calculate a proximity dose, but that just really takes into account the first mechanism of the large droplets. So right from day one, we started looking at, uh, we were concerned about aerosols right from day one, and we started looking at how we could modify our CFD software to incorporate uh, dispersal of aerosols. And so we, um, we, we modified the capability of the software so that we can represent uh, both uh, the dispersal of aerosols either as a passive scalar or as evaporating particles. We've introduced the capability to, to represent uh, uh, HVAC systems with filtration. And we also have a capability now to, to simulate the impact of the wake caused by movement of people as they, as they move through. One of the unique things that we did right from the start was that we coupled our CFD software to the Wells Riley um, uh, uh, model so that we could take the concentrations of aerosol and convert that into an infection probability. So it's not just talking about concentration, we talk about um, infection probability. And the work we've been doing with this is uh, attempt to verify our model uh, using uh, 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 real world data and also applying the model to try and simulate um, other situations so we can come, come up with mitigation strategies. Uh, we've got several publications. There's one publication on an in-flight infection risk. Uh, uh, there's another paper that uh, I'll be talking about in, in this presentation, looking about uh, infection on trains. Uh, and we have another paper with another RAMP group that is in currently in review, looking at uh, issues to do with how you model this in CFD. One of the first things we looked at is the uh, impact of aerosol dispersion on aircraft. The aviation industry has published a lot of stuff saying about how safe aircraft are uh, from, from, from COVID. Uh, and this is because of the claimed high ventilation rates and the HEPA, use of HEPA filters. And this is some work that was published by Transcom and Boeing uh, fairly recently, which measured in flight the dis distribution of aerosols uh, in, in this experiment. And what they found was that because of the high ventilation rates and the, uh, and the use of HEPA filters, the concentration in the measured area in the, in the cabin section could be reduced by 99.99% uh, from the source. Now that's really fantastic. Uh, and, but they concluded from that, incorrectly in my opinion, they concluded that this means that the risk of infection is minimal during uh, these in-flight situations. Uh, and what we did was we took the concentrations from the experiments and we used our modified Wells Riley model to calculate the risk of infection given the reduced um, uh, in, uh, concentrations the ventilation system produced. And what we found was that for a two hour flight, uh, the uh, infection risk um, uh, varies, the maximum individual infection probability varies from about 4.5% in a mild scenario up to 60.2% in a severe scenario. Uh, and the average infection probability, if we took it over the entire section, uh, varied from about 0.1% to 2.5%. Now, if we compare that with actual statistical data that's been published of infections on aircraft, what we find is that uh, the measured infection probability, uh, the maximum is about 10.1% uh, with an average of 0.7%. And that falls very closely in line with what our uh, simplified model is actually predicting. For a 12-hour flight, what we found was that uh, infection probability varies, the maximum infection var probability varies from 24.1% up to 99.6% for a 12 hour flight. For, and the, in, um, the average infection probability varies from about 0.8 to about 10.8%. A huge mitigation, a very successful mitigation is if everyone wears masks. And if you wear masks, you can reduce the average infection probability by about 73%. But what we found also is that if you remove your mask on a 12 hour flight, for a one hour a meal break, um, you, you then re, you, you increase the infection probability by about 59%. So basically the conclusion and, the, and, the, and all the misinformation that the aviation industry is putting forward that how safe it is on aircraft, you really need to take that with a pinch of salt. Uh, the next thing we did was then we looked at how to verify our CFD model. And we're using this real data from a Chinese uh, uh, study of infection on their high-speed trains. Uh, they, um, they studied uh, um, uh, uh, over a period of time from December 2019 to March 2020, uh, something like 2,300 actually infected 
uh, uh, index patients that had boarded the trains, and they looked at 72,000 contacts on the train, and they and they and they did quite a detailed study of this. And what they found was that the infection probability um, on in these carriages was about 10.3%. The thing to note about these carriages are different to the UK carriages. They have extremely high ventilation rates, uh, 44 air changes an hour uh, and 24 air changes an hour, whereas on the UK trains, it's more like eight um, air changes an hour. So we've got that data to compare against. So we, we, we modeled it using our CFD software and we're using our, our scalar model uh, for um, uh, gas release. I haven't got uh, time to go through the details here, but essentially we model a source of infection in each of the five seats separately, and then we combine the data to give you some sort of average um, uh, um, um, uh, overview of what's going on. And we and we look at um, we take into account the ventilation system and the filtration system on the train in the CFD software. Uh, we also did a mesh sensitivity study to uh, to identify an appropriate mesh to use, and we ended up using the uh, the, um, the 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 medium mesh. Uh, which gave us pretty good agreement with the very fine mesh. So most of these calculations are based on the, the medium mesh, which is, which, is pretty, which is pretty good. And it's about 2.2 uh, million cells to model that, that one carriage. Now, this is our modified Wells-Riley equation that we use in conjunction with the CFD model. And this takes into account the percentage of people wearing masks, because not everyone on the train wears masks. And in these calculations I'm going to show you, uh, the, the assumption is that 40% of the passengers are wearing face coverings. Okay, and, and if we now compare our CFD predictions against the measured data, what we find is that the, uh, it, what was measured was that there was 10.3% maximum uh, infection probability for the person seated next to the, uh, the infected person. And in our CFD simulations, we end up with 14.7%, which is pretty close. And if you also look at the average, um, the seat that had the greatest uh, infection probability and the least infection probability, we're getting similar results uh, from our CFD calculations. And what I'm showing you here is a, uh, two graphs showing the um, infection probability as a function of exposure time. These journeys are up to eight hours. The squares represent the measured data and the solid line represents our models. And I think you'll agree, we've got pretty good agreement uh, against the, um, uh, the measured data. So we've got some confidence that this model is, is doing uh, something that's reasonable. If we now delve into what the model is saying in more detail, this becomes very interesting. One of the things we see is that the, um, this diagram here is showing you the quanta, uh, the, if you like, the concentration of aerosol-based uh, uh, on a passenger, infected passengers in seat 6C. And what you, the, the first thing to note here is that there's a very asymmetrical distribution of um, uh, concentration of aerosol. And that means that there is an asymmetric infection probability distribution. And the diagram below shows you the infection probability for each seat uh, in percent uh, for the passenger, the infected passenger seated in seat 6C. And it's really important to, to note that there is an asymmetric distribution. So it's not a circle around the, uh, the source uh, with equal probability of infection. Uh, it, it is very significant actually behind the, um, uh, the, uh, the seats behind the infected passenger compared to the seats in front. Uh, and the seat obviously next to the passenger has got a very high uh, probability. So that gave us some, some detail into what's going on um, inside the train. Uh, and, and, and also it shows that the course assumptions that are usually used when you just simply use the Wells-Riley equation uh, are really not applicable in these cases. The Wells-Riley uh, approach assumes you have a uniform distribution of, um, of, 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 um, of quanta across the entire volume. And that's simply not happening. Uh, and so then we looked at uh, different mitigation, uh, non-pharmaceutical -ph mitigations, and what effect that would have on um, infection probability. And so we looked at various things. So if we increase the um, uh, ventilation uh, filtration to 100%, so a super HEPA filter, the maximum infection probability only decreases um, uh, only a small amount. 
the, av the, the maximum, but the average decreases uh, uh, from about 1.2% to about 0.6%. And so the number of uh, infected people on board predicted secondary infections go down from one to about 0.58. If you change the ventilation rate, if you decrease it down to the sorts of level that we have on UK trains, you see that the infection, secondary infections go up from about 1.1 to 2.2, so low infection, uh, higher number of secondary infections with the lower rate. And wearing masks has a huge impact. Uh, so if we have 90% of the passengers on board wearing uh, masks, remember in the base case, only 40% of the passengers were wearing masks. If you increase that to 90% wearing masks, you reduce the number of secondary infections from one down to 0.6. And if you increase, if you give all the passengers N95 masks, so 90% of the passengers are now wearing N95 masks, you reduce the secondary infections um, uh, down to 0 0.05, a huge impact. Uh, and then we also looked at seat blocking strategies. What if you start leaving out seats, uh, passengers on seats, and the most effective seat blocking strategy basically meant you had passengers seated in the A, C and F seats in odd rows, and this would reduce the number of secondary infections down to about 0.16. Now, clearly, if you're doing the seat blocking, uh, you've got um, 3.15, uh, you've got uh, uh, much fewer passengers on board. And so to have the same, uh, to transport the same number of passengers, you'd have to uh, run 3.15 times as many trains. We also looked at the impact of, um, uh, of inoculation. And here we have, uh, we're using the data for the, uh, the 617 variant. Uh, we have 51% of the UK population has been, uh, has got one dose and 30% of the population has got two doses. And the effectiveness against the 617 strain um, is indicated here. This is from the data from the PHE. And if we build that into our model, um, all that's doing is reducing the infection probability by about 40% in this situation. And so this reduces the number of secondary infections from about one uh, in the case where there's no vaccination to about 0.6. So there's still a significant risk of infection, uh, even though you've got a vaccinated population. Uh, the very last thing I want to I want to quickly get on to is that we also model the particles instead of just looking at the uh, 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 treating uh, the, the 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 spread of the um, um, of the of the uh, the aerosols as a, as a scalar, we can also look at a particulate approach as I'm showing you here. And this becomes particularly important when we're looking at um, uh, the impact of people moving and walking in corridors. And I hope you can see this, there are four people walking here. And here we have the lead person uh, emitting a cloud of aerosols which are infected with COVID. And, what you, and as you can see, each one of those agents that are following are two meters behind the person in front. So the two meter separation really doesn't give you uh, much protection from this um, aerosol cloud. Uh, and so you really have to question uh, the, the use of agent-based models and just looking at a dose based on um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the two meter separation concept. Uh, I haven't got time to talk about this, but we're, we're doing similar simulations in buildings to look at the impact of ventilation systems in buildings. I just want to quickly go on to my conclusions as I see I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, so to conclude the presentation then, agent-based models can provide insight into the negative impact of physical distances, distancing, uh, but usage of agent-based models is limited to capacity, throughput, and level of service analysis. You can also do proximity dose but the proximity dose should not be related to the infection probability. That's a mistake I think many people are making. Uh, to understand the potential impact of dispersal of contaminated respiratory aerosols on infection probability within complex spaces, it's essential to consider the impact of convection currents uh, from body heat, uh, the natural and forced ventilation and, the inter and, and its interaction with the spatial configuration, the wake effects caused by moving individuals, and all of this requires a CFD analysis. These factors can generate asymmetrical dispersal of contaminated aerosols, drive contaminated aerosols in unexpected directions, not this simple two meter uh, diameter circle, uh, and generate persistent hotspots, uh, severely impacting the ability of agent-based models to predict infection probability and the 
um, uh, effectiveness of uh, mitigation strategies. Within complex spaces, the, des uh, the desirable simplifying assumption of a well-mixed environment and hence the appropriateness of simplistic treatments such as Wells-Riley model for mitigation analysis is questionable and potentially misleading. Um, simply imposing high uh, air change rates may not be sufficient, uh, may not be a sufficient mitigation strategy. HEPA filters alone may not be a sufficient mitigation strategy. Masks can be very, very effective, but requires public buy-in, adherence and education and partial inoculation and population immunity can be factors that we build into our models to and, and hence calculate uh, infection probabilities. Um, what we are currently doing with the, in my research group is we're, we're currently exploring the development of a new coupling between agent-based models and CFD uh, to enable the agent-based models to move the agents in the CFD model. Uh, so that the, the agent-based model is, is propelling the agents around the space. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for a super interesting talk. I'm afraid in the interest of time, I might leave uh, you to have a look at the chat and because there's a couple of questions. There's, there's been quite a few questions actually in, on your talk, but we don't have any time uh, and I'm, I'm conscious that I, I want to leave the last speaker the, enough time for Not a problem. I'm, I'm happy talk. to take... I'm happy to take questions during the coffee so break as there's, well. Uh, yeah, and maybe perhaps that's another another option. So let's move quickly to the next and